the sign of ischemia on ECG. Now, first of all, we have to say that the ischemia is graded. Relatively, the small ischemia that obliterating the coronaries a little bit does not have any kind of ECG sign or almost anything the patient can feel. So basically, sometimes it can be manifested as an arrhythmia. For example, some premature bit formation can come, and uh, and, th and then that's it. Only that's it. This is what the sign is. The worst thing that usually who has a premature bit formation during exercise. So uh, because regularly when it, you have the exam period, you can have premature bit formation, but at rest not by effort. So if you do see some effort, uh, effort induced arrhythmias, that can be the uh, bad sign for ischemic heart diseases. So ischemia relatively doesn't have any sign on the ECG. If you do have a more severe condition that can be manifested, that can be painful. And this is what is called angina that we, you know, on the ECG we call as a lesion. There is a more severe condition and uh, the patient sense pain and usually it will stop immediately what they are doing and the angina disappears. This is the stable angina or effort angina that we have. The more severe condition that we do have an unstable angina that of course the pattern mechanism is completely different. You know that because you uh, watch the videos and uh, that can be uh, let's see, a very late uh, or phase or almost is a myocardial MI or an early stage of the acute myocardial infarction. And of course, the MI is the worst situation. Now, the difference between stay, uh, the angina and MI is that angina is reversible. Why? MI is irreversible condition. If you are not doing anything, the patient uh, we'll have a necrosis, so heart necrosis, and that tissue formation. And this is why it's a, a worse prognosis, because the scar never be healed in the heart. Now, let's revise or what the ischemia can give us, what kind of sign can be given by the ischemia on, let's see, the ECG. First of all, uh, ischemia usually altering the repolarization. As you know, normally we do have the depolarization the starting in the endocardium and it goes toward the epicardium. And when it goes toward the epicardium, relatively we do have a bipole that is pointing to, and hopefully it will move, Okay, it's moving from the endocardium to the epicardium. And this is why in the electrode that is uh, placed on the surface of the chest around the epicardium that you get have positive charges. As you learn from physiology, that the repolarization doesn't have the same kind of direction, but repolarization exactly the opposite. Plus, it will start whenever the depolarization ended the last. And this is why uh, the repolarization starting slower and speeding up while they are going toward the endocardium. If you are looking at the shape of the T wave, it's never symmetric. The first slope is not as, let's see, high or fast as the second one. And this is why it's not symmetric at all. Now, that's a normal situation what will happen. But what, what happening when we do have, let's see, the smallest ischemic charge, when we have a subendocardial area that is, doesn't have enough oxygen supply. Normally, the coronary is passing the myocardium from the epicardium to the endocardium, plus the blood that is the endocardium or in the cavity of the uh, ventricle is stretched and usually compressing the vessels in the endocardial area. This is why the endocardium usually is the first sign or the first place where we have the ischemic sign. 
So what will happen? The depolarization is not altered because the depolarization goes from the endocardium. Epicardium and doesn't need any kind of energy. All right, so it will go the same way. What will happen to depolarization? In the epicardium, we don't have any problem. These cells are healthy. They do have enough oxygen supply. So they don't have any anaerobic condition. So the energy uh, uh, synthesizing capability is good. So it can start the depolarization here and goes into endocardium, toward endocardium. But it will slow down a little bit around the endocardial area. And this is why now we do have a little elongation in the second part of the T wave. So that means we do have a symmetric T wave. So the symmetric T wave can be the sign of ischemia, but nothing else is almost impossible to diagnose based on this. Now what will happen when we do have a transmural or let's see severe subepicardial uh, ischemia? The depolarization is still goes the same way from endocardium to the epicardium. This is why the QRS complex is not altered. But the repolarization here, it cannot be started because you need to generate ATP to pump out the sodium. Now, if you don't have normal oxygen supply, this is why the ATP synthesis it's failing and anaerobic condition needs more time to generate the same amount of ATP. This is why the repolarization could start whenever it had the longest time to uh, form the ATP and pump out the sodium. This is why the depolarization and repolarization has the same kind of direction. However, they have a different ion movement. This is why the PVP completely opposite of the QRS complex, okay? So the inverted negative T wave, this is what is called coronary T wave, coronary T wave. Now, anything between the flattering or biphasic or negative T can be the sign of ischemic changes, ischemia, all right? Now, the next one, when we do have Okay, I think, and kids, yes, you uh, want to yes, ask some? Doctor, can you again explain how does the repolarization in the sub uh, epicardium happens? Repolarization in the sub epicardium. Okay, so you are talking about uh, the first one normally. Why yeah. the repolarization started? The no, no, it's the third one, the sub epicardial ischemia. Okay, because it cannot start in the sub end epicardial area because this area is ischemic. Now, for the repolarization, you have to pump out the sodium from the intracellular spaces out, and this needs energy. So the sodium potassium ATPase pump needs energy. And you have for this, you need ATP. If you produce the ATP through the aerobic condition, it's relatively very fast. The efficacy is much higher than an anaerobic condition. And because only this area has the, or let's say both area has anaerobic condition, but it, the ATP generation is determined by the length of the time that it's for the ATP synthesis. So more time, more ATP. This is why it's starting in the endocardial area, okay? not in the epicardial area, because epicardial area did not have enough time to generate that amount of ATP that needed to pumping out the sodium. Okay, doctor, thank you. All right, now, what about the next step when the patient usually sensing pain, and that is the sign of angina. In this condition, what happening that the membrane potential at rest cannot be maintained because we do not have enough energy and the cells are somehow the membranes are so leaky. This is why there are some positive charges still left inside the cells. So if you are looking at the membrane potential is be not as negative as in the normal condition, meaning that outside we still have some negatively charged ion. So we do have a bipole that is pointing from 
the lesion, the area that has the lesion, toward the normal area. This is the herd current that we do have at rest. Now, and of course, if you think about a little bit, how many positive charges can flow inside the cells? In lesion, we have less comparing to the normal situation. This again, this is why the systolic injury current be different and the diastolic current be different as well. So this is why the ST segment plus the baseline is affected in this condition. Let's see how, you will understand easily. The, the smallest problem when we do have this kind of lesion located in the subendocardial area, what will happen? This lesion, so the subendocardium, be more negative comparing to the healthy epicardial area. So at rest, the baseline is shifted a little bit to the positive way. So the baseline is up. You don't see it on ECG because on ECG, you are not measuring the absolute voltage, you are measuring the changes. So what we do see that the depolarization will start at the higher baseline, the fast baseline, and that as long as the positive charges flowing in, they will record the positive deflection. And when we do have every positivity flow inside the cells, of course, between the lesion and the normal, we do not have any potential difference because everything is zero, okay? So now we are going to the absolute zero baseline. So that's be the normal baseline, but here this is lower than the, let's see the fast baseline. And what the repolarization does, the repolarization restores the original area. So everything goes to out in the normal area and some positive charge left in the lesion. So again, this current is still there. So we do have a little bit higher positive baseline. Now the sum of this, that the ST segment is depressed. This is what we will see on ECG. So ST depression, usually meaning angina and usually stable angina manifested as an ST depression. Now, if we do have a transmural or subepicardial lesion, exactly the opposite will happen. Now, uh, this graph is not good because now we do have the lesion is right here, okay? That's okay, it's, this graph is fine, but this kind of shaded area should be located outside. So this comes here and we do have a bipole that pointing toward, let's see the healthy area, is the endocardium. This is why the baseline is moved down. And when the depolarization comes, everything flows in and we go back to the absolute zero baseline. So, and restoring the normal situation. So as it manifested as an ST elevation. So this be the clinical sign of a sub-epicardial or transmural lesion, ST elevation. Now, what do we call as pathological ST elevation? If the ST segment that is starting after the J point of the S wave, and it's bigger than more than one millimeters in the limb leads, in lead number one, two, three, AVL, AVF, AVR, or more than two millimeters in the chest lift from V1 to V6. This is what we call as a abnormality. And another thing, <clears throat> and another thing that could happen that ST depression, usually ST depression, the measures is half the ST segment elevation. So the limb leads is half millimeters and the chest leads one millimeter is already pathologic condition if we do have ST depression. Now, necrosis. Necrosis when the tissue is dying or be dead, what happening, no electric activity at all. So if you have the depolarization, this area is cannot generate any kind of deposits. So that's be inner. So if you are looking at 
from here, every charge goes away from this point. So here we're detecting a negative Q wave, while in the opposite side, we're detecting a positive R wave. This is why the Q wave is very informative of the sign of necrosis. Now, what can be the sign of a pathological Q wave? In those leads where we do see normally Q wave, the Q should be wide, about one millimeters, and should be deep, about one fourth of the R. That's the pathological Q wave. And in addition, this Q wave should be seen in two consecutive leads. So if you do see this Q wave in V1, V2, that's okay, or V2, V3, fine. But if you do see only in one, such as in V1, and nothing else, that doesn't mean that's a pathological Q wave, okay? Now, for another thing, if you do see Q wave where you should not see Q wave, such as in, for example, in the anterior, it's in V1, V4, that again can be pathological. Or if you, if you have a previously registered ECG and the patient never had or had a small Q and now, together with the uh, clinical sign of MI, so angina, you do see the deepening of the Q wave, so that could mean MI or necrosis. Another thing that <clears throat> could be the sign of necro necrosis, when we have R reduction, and that could be due that the, thick, the thickness of the muscle is not the transmural MI, but we do have a small amount of subepicardial MI, and that causes an R regression. So this can be the sign of MI. Now, uh, okay, diagnosis MI. All right, very, very important. First of all, symptoms, diagnostic ECG changes, if you do see it, if you do see it, because about 50% of the cases, there is no sign and serum cardiac marker elevation. If you do see ECG sign, that can be the stem MI, the S, uh, S, the elevated myocardial MI, or if not, it meaning that the necroenzyme of the myocardium is positive. However, there is no sign on ECG, that means N STEMI MI. Okay, good, good. Yeah, can go through. Now, <laughs> the time and duration of MI and the different phases. At the first glance, when we do have a transmural, uh, let's see, lesion, that's manifested as an ST elevation. That's a hyperacute stage that usually lasts immediately or start immediately and last per hours, because if you're not doing anything, that necrosis developed. So they used to diagnose acute when we do have a sign of necrosis. Today, if somebody has an MI, the clinical sign of MI, uh, the patient taken to the CVC and they implant a catheter. And of course they put a stent and ST elevation disappears and the patient never had MI. Now that's the hyperacute stage. But if the patient cannot get to the CVC, they could develop necrosis, and that is an acute phase. So that's in the first few hours to one week can last the acute. After the subacute, that is coming from one week to one month, and definitely about one month, everything is definitive. So what they do, if the ambulance is called, they are taking the blood immediately and they're recording the ECG. If you do see the ST elevation, very typical sign of uh, MI on ECG, there is no more, no further uh, for the diagnosis because your diagnosis immediately can be that ST elevated myocardial MI. But if you don't see anything, but the necroenzyme shows an elevation, that means that you do have a non ST elevated myocardial MI. So this is how they diagnose MI, and that's important because as about 50% of the cases 
there is no sign from ECG, and this is why we have to take the blood samples, be sure that the patient uh, will have MI or not, but of course they will do it in the uh, clinic, and they do immediately, but they can have, for example, ultrasound to see how the uh, car, I mean, the, the ventricle is moving, whether it's symmetrically or not, or maybe they do have a little dilation. So some other test is available to diagnose myocardial MI. So this is the summary of the different stages. First, when we do have the onset of the pain, usually the ST segment of the T wave is elevated. So ST elevation is called a dome-shaped ST elevation. And when the acute is starting, it's meaning that the necro, the sign of necrosis is occurring immediately. And of course, meanwhile, the ST elevation goes back, goes a little bit backward, but the T wave starts to develop or turning to the negative one. And because the lesion ST elevation is a uh, it's a clinical that I would say clinical that be the cell cannot tolerate forever that they cannot maintain the normal membrane potential and slowly those cells will die or proving the circulation and true ischemia it will heal. So this is why in subacute stage only we have a Q wave and the T inversion, the sign of ischemia and sign of necrosis. And later on, after one month, when the circulation is restored. The ischemia can disappear. Of course, there is no ST changes, but we still have the sign of necrosis, so it won't disappear. And this is why it's called the definitive one. So ST elevation, hyperacute, Q wave, ST elevation, acute, subacute, Q wave, and T inversion, and only Q wave, that's a definitive stage. So if you do have ST elevation, at least hyperacute or acute, depending on the presence of the, let's say, necrosis. If you don't have necrosis, you don't have Q wave. If you have, yes, there is. Now, why do we do this kind of this, uh, localization of uh, MI? Because different coronary supplies, different areas of the heart, and depending on where we do see this typical sign, as I showed here, whatever you see in which electrode, you can see where, which coronary is occluded. If you do see, for example, in the anterior lead and lateral lead from V1 to uh, AVL, this area is usually supplied with the left um, uh, anterior descending uh, coronary areas, or we do have a circumflex area, the left circumflex area from the lateral area. This is the lateral one. And the right uh, coronary areas, usually that is uh, supplying the inferior area or and the right ventricular area. So this is why the other goes. So if you do see the sign in the inferior lead, such as the two AVF, Three. This is inferior MI, very frequently coming together with the posterior one. Yeah. And uh, because you don't have any kind of, uh, let's see, electrodes, unless we put some dorsal leads, uh, that we do see the mirror imaging in the anterior lead. And those are the post anter uh, inferior posterior MI can be. Or another thing, if you do see the sign from V1 to V4, that enteroceptal, V1 to AVL, that's an extensive anterior or anterior lateral leads. Or if you do see only, let's see, in the dorsal leads, such as a V7 to V9, you do have a, a dor a dorsal MI. Okay, and uh, what else? Uh, I think that that's enough. So you can, you can figure out based on the tracings where the MI is located. And for sure, they put a, a angiography and they will determine immediately what could be the problem of the patient and where each coronary is occluded and which is not. 
So this is how you can diagnose and how you can uh, uh, do or figure out where the MI happening in the heart. Okay. Uh, professor? Yes? I have a question about the local localization of the MI. Right. So, so in, in this PPT, uh, so if we have the ST elevation in the 2, 3 AVF. Uh, Inferior lead? Yes. It's meaning so, you do have an inferior MI. Yes. So if we have uh, ST elevation in the 2, 3 AVF lead, uh -huh. it means the, we have the inferior right. MI. Right, right. But, it's a diaphragm. Yes. Okay. But what about the ST depression uh, in the inf inferior lead? Okay, it's depending on if you do have a depression in inferior leads and you do have depression in other leads as well, that's angina, that's not an MI. You have to have ST elevation. Or because if you do have, look at the lateral leads, lead number one, ABL, this is a lateral one. If you do have the sign of ST elevation, you could see as the depression in two, three at AVF because that's exactly the opposite. So that can be the mirror image. Okay. So when we have the ST depression in the all of the all of the leads, it means the angina. angina. Yes, ah, angina. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. But of course, you have to take the, the enzyme measurement. And if it's positive, this is what is called the non-STEMI. So it still can be MI because not everything shown by ECG, all right? So that's, you have to know that not every, every MI could indicate it by ECG, indicated by ECG, okay? Okay. You hear? Somebody uh, raise yes. the hand, okay? Uh -huh. Yes, I have a question. So yeah. um, if you have the ST elevation, in lead two, but not in the other leads, not in the other inferior leads, could that suggest MI as well? No, because I said at least two consecutive leads, you should have the sign of MI. So if you do have only in two, but you don't have anything in lead number three or AVF, this is uh -huh. not an MI. But if you do have in three at AVF, yes, an MI. Then or what EVF and two, yes, is a mine. Okay, then what would be the reason for elevate the ST elevation in only one of the leads? Basically, I have no idea. Okay, <laughs> all right, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, can we go to the tracings? And after you can still ask questions, so don't worry about it. Okay, let's see the tracings. Okay, I turn on, you can see the tracing. Yep. And I'm asking you, okay, please say whoever has this tracing, okay? Okay, 101, who has 101? Hmm? Nobody. I don't think so. I can check it. 101, usually Maximilian. Yeah, I, I didn't get the email, so. <sighs> but I can try to do it live. I don't know why you did not get the email. Who didn't get the email? Only you or nobody got the email? Yeah, doctor, I got the email like today. I mailed you after that you sent me the email. Like today I got in the afternoon. So I forgot to send you an email and nobody said anything except only one guy that was missing the email. No, we got the email. So, okay, it's only one problem that Maximilian so far, he got the email, yes, Maximilian? Yeah, I asked someone in EM14 who has the same teacher, they did not get the email either. So I thought there was, no one got the email. Oh, okay, so please, if you are not getting the email, I usually sending the email by Wednesday evening. Okay, by Wednesday evening, you should get the email. All right. 
So if you don't get any email, please write me, okay? And I'm going to forward to you immediately and write to my Gmail address because that would be the fine. I don't know what kind of email address I sent to you this email, but please, so wait till Wednesday evening. So tomorrow evening and Thursday morning, you can write me immediately that you didn't get anything. All right? All right. Okay. On the next week, uh, well, we're practicing, so relatively, uh, I'm not sending any kind of uh, tracings or any kind of homework because you should practice and I'm going to project only the tracings and everybody will see the tracings there, not before, okay? So only your homework be that watch every videos that I send you, including additionally the hypertrophy and the ion changes and uh, and that's it okay so the practicing that's be the whole uh, work for the next week so you won't get any homework extra homework okay. so next week we have a revision about yes. all the topics yes. and it's also yes. in zoom yes 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 okay all right now so Maximilian didn't get anything, but Maximilian will try. Okay, I okay. Let's do it. I can give you the cursor if you want. Okay, you can control the cursor. Okay, Maximilian. Yes, it's yours. Left click, and after you can use my cursor. Okay, no? yes, it's moving. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, the heart rhythm seems rhythmic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the rule of 300, so we have a heartbeat of 75, which is normal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the most equiphasic one is... This one? EVF, EVF, EVF. EVF. Oh, 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 look. For the axis, you don't use the chest leads. You use only the limb leads, okay? And most equiphasic here... Number two? No, AVF, not? Yeah, uh, so that means we have to look at uh, lead number one. Yes. It's positive, so we have a um, zero degree normal heart good. axis. Very good. Um, okay. Looks, we have like uh, elevated ST segment. So it's uh, no, 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 before you, no, 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 slow, sure. step by step. Okay, let's, let's go through the whole evaluation. First, you said the rhythmicity, fine. After you say the heart rate, fine. After you figure out, you can figure out the axis, I don't care about it, it's okay, you can do it. After you have to figure out the impulse formation, where is originated? Is this a sinus rhythm, yes or no? Do you have P wave? Yes. Frontal? Yes, okay. After, look at the shape of the P wave. Is it normal, it's, uh, uh, it's unique? or there is no bizarre shape of the PV. Okay. It Next looks consistent, one. yeah. Good, very good. Next one, the PR interval is okay in the normal range, yes or no. After the QRS complex is narrow, yes. Here I would say the axis because when we do the QRS complex, the axis should be evaluated. If the QRS is wide, you have to think about intraventricular conduction abnormality. All right, now, Next one, you can look at the Q wave. Can you see pathological Q wave? If not, not. After you can go to the ST elevation and the T, okay? So go step by step. Go from the beginning of the P wave till the end of the T wave. This is how you evaluate and you describe everything, okay? So PR is normal, QRS is narrow, pathological Q wave. Let's see, can you see any pathological Q wave? Uh... Here, V2? Uh, I, well, okay. I getting back, let's see the cursor from you because I magnify it. Okay, let's see. Yes, in V2, it looks like you do have a Q wave, but in, not in V1 and not in V3. Again, one lead doesn't cut, okay? So it's not. This is what I wanted to say. Okay, Yo, go on. So there is no pathological Q wave here. Now you can jump to the ST elevation. 
Yeah, we can see we lead all of these leads that the ST segment is very elevated. Which leads? List it. You have to write it down. V1, V2, V3, V4, V6. And? V6. No. And? And? And then lead number one and AVL. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. again, you are going to the same kind of leads because anterolateral, these is connected to each other. So the anterolateral, you do see ST elevation. Okay. So immediately you know that this is an anterolateral ST elevated myocardial infarction, possible the hyperacute phase because we don't have any Q wave. Now, if you look at in lead number two, three, and AVF, you do see ST depression. Yes? What do you think? Why? Mm. Necro, no. Mm -mm. We were talking about lesions? No, no. Mirror image. Mirror image. Ah. Because Lead number three is the opposite of AVL. If you do see something in AVL, you should see the mirror image in lead number three. Okay. Yeah. Because if you look at the hexaxial system, AVL is minus 30, 110, 20 is a lead number three, exactly almost the opposite. Okay. This is why the mirror image can be seen. So don't be surprised if you look at the lateral leads and you do have a elevation. On the inferior leads, you do have ST depression. And the opposite can happen. If you do have an ST elevation in lead number two, three, and AVF, you should see an ST depression in lead number one and AVF. All right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right, next one, 102. Who has, oops, who has 102? I do. Okay, and good. Okay, and uh, all right. Uh, do you want to share your screen or I give you my cursor, okay? Uh, yes, okay. Okay, and your name is? Uh, my name is Juhei. You can also call me Grace. Juhei, uh, but it's written. Juhei. I have to find it. Juhei, Juhei, Juhei. Oh, no, 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 I... you don't. I don't think you... I don't think I need your cursor. I will just explain. Okay, it good. Whatever your login name was, I was looking for. Okay, now tell me. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm hunting with my cursor. Okay. <laughs> just a disclaimer I struggle a lot with the ECG, and I, I'm not sure if I am on the right track, but I will try, anyways. Try. So, starting with the rhythm, it seemed pretty regular to me. Okay. Good. And then, so the rate was around um, 75 because uh, you have four That's and okay. a half. That's mm -hmm. okay. That's okay. And then uh, you said to go to the impulse formation P wave. Like mm -hmm. it was there, but it was like barely perceptible. So I. Yeah, I but it's still there. See, it's still okay. there. You can see some P waves, but not as big as we used to see it. But we still have negativity and positivity in lead number two and negative in EVR. So you can say that, yes, that's a, a sinus uh, rhythm. Okay, you can say. All right. Okay, okay. Um, just one question though. There were, so in case of lead number two, there were some places where the P wave was, it seemed as if it's almost non-existent. Um, well, 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 it can be a little not? noise, can, but it's rhythmic. If it's rhythmic, you cannot think about that some kind of uh, atria premature bit okay. formation or anything. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All, All right. right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it is the sinus um, impulse. And the shape of the P wave is very yeah. small and flat. it's wide. You can, okay. Flat. You can say it's flat. And uh, well, I don't know whether it's too wide or not because I think it's not too wide. So it's not exceeding the 0.1 second. Okay, if you are looking at lead number two, or in V1, it's still, no, it's not too wide. I don't think that is wide. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> all right. All right. Okay. And, um, and then regarding the PR, 
um, I saw depressions in in lead two, and so I suspected pericarditis, but I, I'm not sure about uh, that. No, okay, no. If you do see only in one lead that kind of PR depression, and uh -huh. uh, relatively you don't see you don't see in more places. Usually the pericarditis accompany that you do have ST elevation in a lot of leads independently from each other. For example. You do see ST elevation in lead number two, three, AVF, lead number one, AVL. So uh -huh. in the lateral and inferior as well. And uh, PR is depressed. But that case you can think about that can be some kind of pericarditis. But here, I don't think. And this PR depression, it doesn't occur in everywhere. See, because here you don't see the PR depression. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, no. You have to look at those things that is consequently occurring and, okay. 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 All right. So PR is okay. Fine. No more. Okay. <laughs> All right. PR is okay. And uh, so, and when we look at the QR complex, then mm -hmm. it's narrow. Well, I thought it was narrow, but there's like a notch no. at the end no. of it, the QRS. It's narrow. It's narrow. Okay. In okay. Some, some lead, you can see some notching. It's, for example, in V4. But again, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that. You do have, uh, for example, hypothermia or, or that. no, it's nothing, okay? That's because that's only one lead that mm -hmm. you do have in more lead. That's some kind of muscle activity in some areas. Oh, hell knows why this kind of much occurring. It doesn't show, it's not wide. So it's not a type of uh, bundle branch block. So it's, it's, it's nothing. So it's not indicative of any like early repolarization no. or no? No, no, no. It can, oh my God. Okay. it can be an early repolarization. It can be. And uh -huh. it's not pathological. Okay. Just one question. How do you distinguish between something that's not pathological and that's just like pathological? Uh, because Well, okay. <laughs> Dep depending on the patient, we have to look at the patient as well. Okay. okay. So okay. without a patient, it's difficult to diagnose anything based on only the ECG. This is why it's together. That's an evaluation that needed a patient. So you don't, you are not curing, let's say, the lab results, you are curing the patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have to get a, a correlation. So no. And this kind that early polarization and other thing that is very rare one, this is not the topic that we are dealing with. Okay. Okay. Not the topic. Maybe later on, if you get to the clinic and you be a cardiologist, yes, you can you can search for those small things. But here you should get for the big one, the, the biggest changes. Okay, all right, such as ST elevation or pathological Q wave or T inversion mm -hmm. or widening of the QRS complex. So only a few things that you have to find it. Okay, it's not everything. Okay, okay. Later on, you can do it, but not now. You don't need okay so so when you just explained about how you're supposed to see parallel um results in parallel leads and different leads that's how you sort of prove that the ecg is you know has certain signs that's not always the case it's like for mm -hmm. instance i saw the notches like in different many different leads so i thought it was something pathological but it might not be the case no no okay all right um, okay, and and then so I found the SC elevation, um, mm -hmm. and I suspected that it was like a sub epicardial slash transmural lesion at the acute or hyperacute stage. But again, <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. a bit confused okay. about that. No. no, 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 don't be confused. So you can translate the ST elevation to hyperacute MI, okay? So you don't need to use this transmural or subepicardial lesion. You uh -huh. can use that said uh, ST elevated myocardial MI or hyperacute MI. That's it, period. You don't need to go for the pathophysiological conditions or pathomechanism why we do have an ST elevation. Say it only, yes. If you do have an ST elevation, that's indicative of a hyperacute MI or STEMI. That's it. All right. All right. Okay. ST elevation. Yes, immediately. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And uh, you have to look at which lead that you do see, and you see it in V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, lead number one, and AVL. Again, very similarly to the previous one, we do have a anterolateral or mm -hmm. the same extensive anterior hyperacute MI, or you can say hyperacute or STEMI. That's it. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. 103. Uh, oh, yes. I, I, yes. Question? I have a question. Uh, for, uh, as I know, the further hyperacute stage, uh, T is included in the ST elevation, but for the 102 tracing, is it divided into two? Okay. So, hyperacute, we do see the T inside, let's see the ST elevation, all right? And oh, when, yes. when this is going toward the uh, development of necrosis, so it's meaning that this uh, lesion area that we do have here, in some of the lesion area, it's being necrotized. This is why we do have the pathological Q wave. And some of is being an ischemic one as being here later on. This is why in the late phase of hyperacute, we start to develop a Q wave and a negative T wave, all right? Yeah, okay. but uh, but in the one or, one or two, the T wave is positive. Okay, so if we go here, the tracing, you win. Uh -huh. Okay, let's go to the tracings. Where are the tracings? Okay. The T Which is one? Positive. positive. It's still positive. This is why I said that's a hyperacute. Okay. Uh -huh. You can you can have okay you can have Q wave and only S elevation and included the T wave is still acute. If you do see a Q immediate and S elevation, that's acute immediately. Okay, oh. independent because the T inversion occurring at the late phase of an acute only in the late phase before the subacute starting. Okay. All right, now 103, who has 103? Yes, I do. Okay, do you want my cursor or you can see it? Oh, that's fine, I can okay. say it. Good. So uh, I think it's rhythmic first. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the heart rate was about uh, 100. Okay. And so, and there is a P wave, which means it is a sinus rhythm mm -hmm. and axis. Uh, so I thought the AVL was epiphasic, so uh, lead two is perpendicular, and since lead two is positive, uh, the axis should be around 60 degrees. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so for the shape of the P wave, um, uh, well, I'm not really sure if it's normal or not, but it, it seems normal, but Okay, all right. Now, uh, we haven't studied yet how the P wave looks like. So it looks like that the P wave, okay, a little bit matching. You can see it a little bit matching the P wave, but it's not wide. So this is why you cannot state that that's a left atrial hypertrophy. And in V1, okay, in the terminal phase is deeper a little bit, but it's not let's see elongated. So I won't say that that the left atrial hypertrophy, another thing. Hyper ECG is not the best tool to diagnose hypertrophy. Okay, maybe you do see the signs. So if you say that uh, due to the notching of the P wave can be a left atrial hypertrophy, but you have to use ultrasound to prove it. That's it. Okay. So it's not okay. tall, not wide. I won't see that any any changes of the this P wave. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so. The PR interval, uh, I think it's fine. Good. And the QRS, um, I think it's narrow. Okay. So, uh, but then we see uh, ST elevation in... Pathological Q wave first, please. Oh, yes. Pathological Q wave. And, is, uh, and the width of the QRS. In. Okay, the width of the QRS is wide. Is it wide? Yeah. I think it's fine. 
it's what one two three and a half so it's wide it's 0.12 it's wide it's wide okay okay so it's wide it meaning that we do have a uh, ventricular um... intraventricular conduction abnormality. Ah, yes. exactly exactly okay so since we can see the pathological q wave in v1 v2 v3 v4 Mm -hmm. uh, and we can also see a uh, ST elevation in V2, V3, V4, and also V5, I think. Yes. So I thought it would be um, an acute uh, anteroceptal MI. Good. Very good. Very, very good. Great. Plus, why do, what is the reason why we have this YQRS? The ventricular conduction abnormality. But which one? Which one? You have to be more specific. If you do have a wide QRS, we have to assume that we do have an intraventricular conduction abnormality. Which one? How do you diagnose which bundle is blocked? Mm. Whenever you do see the wide R wave, okay, the block is there. This is what I said. If you do see the wide R complex in V1, you do have a right bundle branch block. If you do see the wide nudged R wave in V6 or lead number one AVL, that's the left bundle branch block. But here you do have a right bundle branch block. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so please don't forget about the bundle branches because we will have a lot. Okay. Okay. All right, good. Next one, 104. Who has 104? Yes, yeah, somebody has written something in the chat. Again, there is no... Okay, let's see. Uh, 104, heart rate is around 60, okay. And uh, okay, equiphasic in okay, the axis equiphasic. None of them is equiphasic. Maybe lead number three is equiphasic, I think. So that's B around 30. I would say that the axis is 30. Okay, we do have P wave. Yes, we do have P wave. The PR interval is long. See, the PR is longer. Very good. Okay. That's first degree of AV block. Okay, good. Very good. Okay, now next one. Let's look at the next one. We do have narrow QRS complex is okay, fine. Pathological Q wave, we do not see any pathological Q wave, none of the leads. Good, ST elevation. No, in lead number one, no. Uh, two, three, AVF, yes. We do see ST depression in AVL. And either ST depression in lead number V2, V3. Okay, this is what we have. So, the summary. We do have first degree AV block, sinus written, inferior hyperacute myocardial MI, because we do have ST elevation in two, three, AVF. Plus, not only the inferior, but posteriorly, if possible, we do have a MI. So, inferior, posterior, hyperacute MI that we have. So, there is no pathogenic Q wave. If you look at the R progression in the chest, it's okay because it's V3, V4. This is where the R is bigger one. So, there is no acute phase, there is no pathogenic condition. So, inferior, 2, 3 AVF, plus the mirror image in the V2, V3, V4 in the anterior lead, that meaning that we do have an inferior posterior uh, hyperacute myocardial MI. Okay, it was clear. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, 105. Wow, that's an interesting ECG. It's a tricky ECG. 105. Okay. Yeah, that's mine. Okay. Uh, so I shall go from the Rismis to first. It's, mm -hmm. 
I think it's quite rhythmic, except one point. Mm -hmm. It's Which not. Point? Uh, like Which? the lead two, uh, the fourth one. One, that's two, a, three, four. That's a little longer. But all yeah, the rest, like, but everything else is fine. So okay, let's, let's, let's leave it out. Okay, let's leave it out. That's okay. There's no way that you can feel this one by sensing the pulse of the patient. <laughs> I don't yeah, think so. Yeah, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the heart rate is so if the heart rate is like we have a little bit more than three uh bucks one, one two three almost four you can say that almost four we have so, so it's, it's normal heart rate okay good and if we go for the axis it's normal because okay. one and if are all positive okay EVL is equiphasic, so this means that we do have about 60, and this looks like as the biggest one in lead number two. Okay. All right. Do we, do we have P waves? Uh, yes. All right. Lead number two positive AVR is negative. Okay. PR interval. PR interval should be fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's. There's hardly any, right? So it means short. Okay. So you don't have any rest behind the P wave. So there is no isolated recline behind the P wave. The QR is okay. starting right away after the P wave. So the PR is short. What does it mean when the PR is short? Uh, oh, it's. It's like atrial or junk. It's not from the sinus, is it? Uh, well, PR is short. What does it mean? PR is long. Oh, it means okay. first degree AV block. If the PR is short, means there's a what do you call it? A shortcut bypass. Yes, that's it. That's it. That's it. Uh -huh. What does it mean? What does it mean? Uh, how do you call that? I don't remember. That means pre excitation syndrome. Yes, yes, yes. That's the one. Okay. And then, and the which kind of what kind of oh. pre excitation syndrome we have? Uh, there are two. Yes. And which one is this? <laughs> uh, this one is this. QRS is wide. Yes. Is a Wolf Parkinson white? Yes, that's a Wolf Parkinson white. WPW syndrome. Yes, yeah, that's it. For WPW syndrome. Okay, so PR is short, QRS is wide. Okay, that's a WPW syndrome. If you want to say whether the A type or B type, so how do you judge it? Whether this is located on the left or the right side? A bit on the left side, there's a tall R wave. In yes, V1, V1, if it's located on the left side, in V1, you should see R wave, yes. But here you do see the opposite one, so that's a B type, okay? That's located on the right side. Okay, that's a B type, okay. Next one that you should look at, pathological Q wave. Do you see pathological Q wave? Yes. Um, yes, you do see in V1, V2. It's okay, it's pathological. But this is due to the WPW syndrome, the delta wave. Okay, it's not due to MI. It's very okay. important because there are some conditions when we do see pathological Q wave, but it's not due to MI. This is secondary. It's due to WPW or due to left mm -hmm. of the block. So there are some other situations that's not the primary STT changes. That's a secondary one, for example. If you do have conduction abnormality, that can cause uh, ST alteration, and that's called a secondary. 
if we cannot explain, but that's uh, ischemic changes. So mm -hmm. this is why if you do see some kind of conduction abnormalities, you have to uh, aware that you can have ST changes or Q wave as well, such as here in WPW syndrome. So in WPW syndrome, you see, see ST depression that's secondary to the WPW syndrome, okay? Pathological Q wave secondary to the WPW syndrome is not MI. It's only one problem that if you know that the patient, for example, is 14 years old, okay, it's a young one, fine, immediately you know that it's impossible to have MI. But if this patient is 50 or 60 years old, this patient could have MI in addition to the WPW syndrome. Now that's a difficult one. And this is mm -hmm. why you need the necro enzyme to measure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not the ECG that alone can be used in this situation, especially if you have some additional problem. Now another thing, for example, left bundle bench block. Left bundle bench block can cause QS complex in the anterior leads. Yes, but left bundle bench block can be due to MI. So when you do have a ischemic changes of a certain vessels that supplies the bundles, that can block as well. So this way you have two things. And this is why they say that if the patient has, for example, the typical sign of uh, MI, so angina, for example, plus the patient never had left bundle bench block, and now you do see the sign of left bundle bench block, you have to assume that the patient has MI, okay? Mm -hmm. so this is helping you to diagnose in this, in this uh, tricky situation, uh, the MI, because not every time you have a clear cut, nice narrow S wave or the QRS complex and the ST elevation and everything. Sometimes, for example, here, yeah, you have a conduction abnormality and it looks like this patient has MI, but this patient don't have, it doesn't have any MI. Okay. Okay, so that was a tricky ECG. Okay. 106. Let's see who has 106. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's me. Okay. Your turn. Uh, okay, so uh, we have sinus bradycardia, normal axis, normal uh, conduction. Uh, what do we normal see... conduction? What do we normal conduction? Where do uh, we have the normal conduction? AV conduction? No, uh, yeah, I mean, no AV block. <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay, normal AV conduction, okay, but you have to add, okay, go on. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, on one hand, we have a pathological Q wave in 2 free, two free AVF in purely, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, and also a uh, third of ST elevation in the inferior mm -hmm. and the lateral, V5, mm -hmm. V6, maybe, well, and ST V6. depression. Okay. Sorry. ST depression where? Uh, one AVL with the wave inversion okay. maybe, mm -hmm. uh, yes. uh, which would correspond to maybe uh, LCX occlusion, inferior lateral MI, something like that. Okay, uh, In some yes, okay. Uh, but uh, also the morphology of the ST is quite strange, it's a bit more uh, concave than usual. It's okay. Uh, yeah, but no, 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 it's not that one. <laughs> okay. What do you want to say? It's more concave. Uh, so it, can... uh, I mean, it also have like a LVH uh, uh, criteria. Okay. Uh, so it might be a, a normal variant of LVH. Yeah, it can be. Yes, it's true. <laughs> okay, you're an expert. Okay, good. You have good eyes. Yeah, so that if you diagnose only that's an acute inferior MI, that's okay, that's fine, okay. And the, with the lateral, I don't think that the lateral one because sometimes V6, because V6 is going a little bit behind, let's see, lead number uh, two. So that's be a little bit behind the thing. So it can be, that's a sign of an inferior. Sometimes you can have an ST changes in V6. <laughs> Okay, so that's an inferior acute uh, MI. That's it. It's enough if you say this one. That's more than enough yet. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. 
Okay, 107. Who has 107? Oh, I do. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so this is rhythmic. And okay. her rate is about 90 <laughs> to 100. You're, Sorry. <laughs> your doggy, yes. Okay. <laughs> So the heart rate is about 100. Mm -hmm. And an axis is also in the normal range. Mm -hmm. And also there is P wave. And I also this is sinus P wave, sinus. Mm -hmm. And the PR interval is normal. And also QR as complex is narrow enough. Mm -hmm. And I think there is ST elevation. Where? On the lead two and three. Okay, good, very good. And also there is pathological negative Q wave on the I don't see any pathological Q wave. I don't see. So this any. is a normal. No, no, no. Q it's wave. not a normal because you say this normal Q wave, but uh, only what the pathological is here. This a P three and ADF. You do have an ST elevation. That's it's an inferior. You can see that's an inferior MI. Yes, yes, yes. STEMI inferior STEMI. This is what you is have. Is it acute or? Oh, I don't think that the acute is a hyper acute. It can be hyper acute. Okay. And and an additional one, if you want, if you look at V1, there's an RSR complex. So it can be, but it's not wider, the QRS complex. So I would say maybe I'll, it is not a, a completely incomplete right bound to bench block. It looks like a little bit the S wave. If you go here, a little bit wider S wave is here, but that's a normal variant can be a normal variant in v1 so it's not the right one the best one it's very common the incomplete right one the best block it doesn't mean anything so that's good okay all right let's see 108 108 who has 108 uh it's mine okay it's rhythmic mm -hmm. the heart rate is around 85 beats per minute the axis seems to be normal between 0 and 90. Mm -hmm. So the PR interval is also normal. Then there is ST elevation at V2 and V3. Mm -hmm. um, the amplitude of R wave is elevated in V2. So I think it's normal. Mm -hmm. It's narrow, the QRS complex is narrow, yeah. Hello. Yeah. yeah. So? Hello. So what, what, is the, what is the problem here? So let's see, because we do have some problem. What about um, the Q wave? Q wave, it might, it's elevated. Uh, no, Q wave be, is not elevated. It's you have uh, elongated. The amplitude no, is no, elongated. No, no, no. That does not, no, that doesn't matter. Prolonged. In V1, V2, V3, V4, we do have pathological Q waves, okay? Okay. All right, okay. So mm -hmm. it's indicate at plus we do have S elevation. It's indicating that we do have a sign of myocardial MI and an anterior lead. So we do have an anterior ST elevated myocardial MI. Okay? okay, this is what we have. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's okay. it. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Good. All right. One o nine. Who has one o nine? No. I just have one o nine. Okay. Let's see it. Um, yeah. This. Uh, the axis is abnormal. So there's that rhythmicity. Is it rhythmic or not? It's not rhythmic, it's uh, rhythmic. Okay, good. Heart rate? 
almost five, so can be 65. It's okay, normal. Okay. And the uh, conduction is not, uh, seems like there's a block. It's not. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Do we have P waves? Well, very barely to see, but yes, we do have P waves, okay? So we have P waves, the PR is normal, okay? And QRS is wide, yes? Yeah, it's wide. Okay. It's wide. All right, so, now, what about the axis? What about the axis? The axis is, uh, is, is elevated. Hmm? Axis, no, yeah. cannot be. Uh, the axis one positive AVF negative lab deviation lead number two. Well, it's a little bit more negative, so it's meaning that we do have an extreme lab deviation. Okay, let's remember extreme lab deviation, right? Yes, okay. Now, why the QRS is wide? Uh, is why increased uh, time of depolarization. Mm -hmm. Because we do have intraventricular conduction abnormality. Right bundle yeah. bench block or left bundle bench block? Which one? Left bundle. What? Which one? Right bundle. Right bundle branch block. Yes, we have. Plus, we do have an extreme left deviation. That means we have a anterior hemi block and the right bundle bench block that's a bifascicular block okay all right uh, pathological q wave is any i don't see no st elevation yes yes we do have in v1 v2 v3 v4 maybe in v5 as well so this means this patient has an anterior MI as well. Okay, so bifascicular block and an anterior hyperacute MI. This is what we diagnose. Okay. Yes. Sir. All right. One o ten. Anybody has one o ten? Yes, I have one o ten. One o ten. Okay. So I see it's rhythmic or regular. Mm -hmm. And the heart rate is approximately 100 beats per minute. Okay. And the PR interval is normal. And the QRS interval is narrow. So it's also normal. Okay. So we can see there is no uh, impulse abnormality or conduction abnormality. Very good. So now we look at the axis. We see that lead one is positive and AVF is also positive, so it's normal axis. Mm -hmm. But when we look at a V1 to V6, we can see ST depression. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Okay, that's it. You don't need to say something else because it looks like it's a stable angina. It looks like the all things you have in two, three, AVF, V2. V3, V4, V5, V6. So that's a sign of angina. That's it. Okay, nothing else. It's not an MR. Good. That's it. You have to look at that. You have to see that as the depression. Okay, 11. One, 11. 111. Who has it? Yeah. Oh, the internet connection is bad. Okay. Uh oh, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. It's very bad. Your internet connection. That's the problem. Okay, I will. I will say it. Okay, I will say it. No, no, it's still not good. It's still not good. Okay, let's look at. It. Is rhythmic. Okay, yes, it's rhythmic. The rate is around. If I'm getting, oops, if I'm getting closer, it means that. Overall, every second we have one beat of 60. So the heart rate is around 60, okay? We do have P wave, sinus P wave, lead number two positive, negative AVR. The PR is okay. Yes, it's less than 0.2 second. The QRS is narrow. Yes, it's narrow. 
And the axis is uh, normal because one positive AVF positive, so it's normal, about 60. I think it's about 60, okay. Uh, pathological Q wave, we do see pathological Q wave V1, V2, okay, only in V1, V2 we do have, yes, nothing else. The ST segment elevation, well, we do see it only in V2, that's it, and negative T wave, negative T wave, negative T wave all the way. So I would say that maybe the septal, septal uh, acute MI, V1, V2, septal acute MI. Okay. All right, let's move on. 1012, who has 1012? It's me. I'm okay. not sure, but uh, okay. Uh, the heart rate is um, 60 and five boxes. Uh, so 300 divided by 560. And then the axis. So it's going to be no. Mm -hmm. because the AVF and the first lead is positive. And uh, somehow uh, the third lead looks um, equiphysic. So okay. it's going to be 30. The axis is going to be 30. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, QRS complex, OK, wait, the input formation. Uh, there are P waves. Uh, so uh, it's a sinus rhythm, mm -hmm. and uh, what else? Okay, yeah, the QRS complex. I think it's wide. No, it's not, so. it's not wide. It's not wide because it's from here to okay. here. That's not wide. It's not wide. Look at here. It's not wide. It's narrow. It's okay. But you do okay. see something. There's no pathological Q wave, but you do see this. Yes. I think. Yes. elevation in V1, V2, V3, V4. Yes. So it's meaning that we do have an anterior hyperacute MI. That's it. This is what we have. Okay. Okay. All right. One thirteen. Wow. That's yes, nice. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I think it's really, but maybe it's too short to tell. Um, the heart rate uh, with C bradycardia is around fifty. Mm -hmm. uh, for the axis, I see lead number one and uh, AVF are positive, so it's normal axis, maybe mm -hmm. more towards the zero, I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, okay, so pass in the impulse generation, and yes, I see P wave, yes, yes, yes. normal sinus rhythm. Yeah. Uh, okay, and then we can see a uh, Wait, it's not me, the noise, I don't know. Yes, I tried to move it. Okay. No, it's all right. I, I, I knew you did it. No, it's again coming back. Okay. Um, so QRS, uh, I think, is um, uh, wide. Yes, I think it's wide. We can see for in a V1. Okay, so I think we have, it's okay, can I? Okay. Uh, so we have intraventricular uh, a conduction abnormalities. So All right. I look uh, on V1 and V6, and I think it's left v LBBP. Very good, very good, very good. Okay. Uh, what else? Now the, ST, the STE, the elevation, so we mm -hmm. can see Okay, uh, in lead two, ST elevation, lead three, and e, lead yeah, so, Okay, V, 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 not oh. lead number, yeah, lead number two, yes. Lead number two and AVF and lead number three, we do have ST elevation. And yes, so, in V6 and V5, we have it. So that meaning that this patient This has is a, the inferior MI or STEMI, inferior STEMI, I don't know. <laughs> 
and laugh about the best blog. That's okay. That's yes, good. Okay. Very good. Very good. Very, very good. Very, very good. That's a difficult ECG because very difficult to diagnose any kind of LMI in the presence of a left bundle branch blood. Yes, you are right. You were very nice. Okay, good. Uh, 114. Who has 114? It's me. Okay. So um, it looks rhythmic. The heart mm -hmm. rate is normal. It's about 75 beats <laughs> per minute. Mm -hmm. And the axis is normal, lead one and AVF are positive, and lead three is equiphysic. Mm -hmm. So um, it's about 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, normal P wave. Mm -hmm. PR interval is normal. Um, mm -hmm. PRS complex is narrow. Mm -hmm. um, we can see. Um, ST elevation in lead three, lead one, three, and AVF. So lead, it's, this is not lead one, this is sorry, lead two. Lead two, lead three, two and AVF. three, and AVF. Okay. So it's acute stage inferior, am I? Okay, I would say hyper acute because in V1, V3, I don't, not in lead number three, I don't see any Q. That's an RS. Okay. Okay. So it's not a pathological Q wave, so only a hyperacute inferior MI. That's it, only, nothing okay. else. Okay, good, very good. 115, who has 115? I think that's mine. Okay. So uh, it's rhythmic and the heart rate is about 100 beats per minute. The axis, the axis was kind of hard for me because everything was equ equiphasic, but I think it's about, it's normal. Um, between zero okay. and based okay, on good. AVR. Okay, yeah, that's good. Uh, sinus wave looks uh, uh normal. Uh, mm -hmm. The P wave looks like it's a sinus beat. Mm -hmm. Uh, the QRS to me, I couldn't really figure out if it's uh narrow or wide or normal. Okay, well, let's count it. Let's count it. Okay, count it here from here to here. That's what this is uh, one, two, three, almost four. So then so it's, it's wide. It's wide. And here as well, you can see very nicely that, okay, up to here, that's wide. Okay. Okay. All right. Wide and? Yes. And then there's, I think it's a pathologic Q wave in uh, V2, V3 for sure, but also maybe V1. And V4. And V4. And then is the, is it the, it's definitely ST elevation, but is it the T and dome in, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, in yes. V3, yes. V4? And okay. Oh. Yes, and V five as well. Okay, so. Yep. So. It's an MI, but I'm not sure what kind. That's of an anterior MI or anteroceptal MI. That's good. But what about the wide QRS complex? Um, <laughs> the wide QRS. I don't know. Yeah, um, some kind of interventricular conduction anomaly, which bundle is blocked. Where do you see the wide R complex? A wide R? Yes. In V1, but I... So, it meaning we do have a right bundle branch block. That's it. Okay. Okay. That's it. In the Thank previous you. one, in the previous one, see when you had to... This is the wide R complex in V5, V6, okay? And lead number one. That was a left bundle branch block. And here, that's not the first one. Here you have in V1. So this is why it's a right bundle branch block plus a enteroceptal acute MI. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, 116. Yeah, it's mine. I'll try. Try. So the, yeah, try so the, yeah, sure. So the rhythm is regular. And the yes. heart rate is, I think, five boxes, so it's 60 beats per minute. Mm -hmm. P waves look normal, so it's sinus mm -hmm. rhythm. Mm -hmm. And the PR segment is also normal. Mm -hmm. And the QRS, I think it's narrow, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure about that. Narrow, that's sure, yeah. that's sure. That's okay, QRS okay, okay. Is narrow. <laughs> and the axis, and the axis, the first lead is positive, and the mm -hmm. AVF. It's also positive. Well, equiphasic. Uh, okay, let's say equiphasic. Yes. Okay. So, so it's normal axis. Okay. And the 
that that is all i was able to decode and for the st elevation no 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 pathological q wave first what pathological q wave okay v1 v2 well, V3, we have R regression and in V4 as well. So, and that's the elevation in V2, V3, V4. So, so it's MI. Anterior acute MI. That's it. Yes, sir. That's it. Okay. okay. Good. Very good. Thank you. 117. Oh, yes, 117. Yes. Ooh, Jesus. Now that's a nice ECG. Yes. So okay. this, is, this is an arrhythmic and there is Q, I don't know. So heart rate is 75 and there is P wave. So it's sinus rhythm and PR interval is normal and QRS mm -hmm. interval is narrow. Mm -hmm. And axis is the normal. Mm -hmm. And V12 and AVR lead is there is ST elevation mm -hmm. and one, two, three, A, B, F, B, four, five, six. It, uh, they have ST depression. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> look at the heart or these yeah. Are. So that's uh -huh. a left ventricle hypertrophy. That's a very nice, big left ventricle hypertrophy. And mm -hmm. this kind of ST segment, what you do have here, that's a strain phenomenon when you do have this uh, hypertrophy. That's be the next when we're talking about the hypertrophies. Okay, and here the very tall R waves again, this ST depression is due to the left ventricle hypertrophy. Only one thing that cannot be explained that's the ST elevation that can be the septal MI. Yeah. Okay. So everything else is due to the left ventricle hypertrophy. And only one thing that is ST elevation that we do see in V1, V2, that's the sign oh, of cute. An MI. The sept well, it's, uh, no, because in V1, if you look at that, we do see the initial R wave. Oops. Uh, yes, we do. And here the V2 is an other one. So it's not a pathological Q wave. If you had a QS complex, that's okay. But this is not. I think uh, that was the last one. Yes, that was the last one, that's 70. Now, I suggest you for the next week, let's meet in the class, okay, in the lab. Let's meet and uh, let's continue there with the practice. I bring some uh, tracings and everybody is going to present personally, okay? So let's 